a part of us up. And so we try to do it in a way where we're not alone, you know, like we're supporting each other. But the more honest we are about ourselves, the more authentic and the weird we get, it's the, like, um, the law of attraction. And so in the places where you just expect it, you know, they come up and, and it's, it's, it's really cool. And so it, it's like getting in the water is really cool, you know, and little by little, but as you get older and you in here, sort of thing. And so now we've decided that instead of just slowly, that we're just going to jump in here. sentience lecture series I've been doing. So throughout the, the rest of the event, you guys are completely welcome to pick my brain. Um, and I'm going to try to compress as much as I can into this hour. And so sentience, let me explain a little bit about sentience. And I'll start with a story. And I had a dream several years ago. And in this dream, I ended up in a, uh, a boardroom with all these scientists and generals. And they had a scientist presenting to everyone, talking about anti-gravity and about this, this flying saucer. He's explaining how it works. And I'm sitting at the table, and I just start laughing when I dream. And, and they all like stop and are like, why are you laughing? And I'm like, what you're saying is absurd. It makes no sense. And they're like, can you explain better? I'm like, yes, I can. They're like, well, you want to go up to the board and explain to us? He's like, sure. So I go up to the board and I start talking about vortexes. And then all of a sudden, Everyone in the main room just goes into an uproar. You're like, oh, this is even more absurd. What are you talking about? People start getting up and leaving. Well, the scientist comes up to me. He's like, hey, so is this what we're going to be working on from now on, vortexes? I was like, yes, absolutely. And I just got really passionate in my dream. And I said, do you know the smallest particles in the universe? And I used to ask this to people a lot. And conventionally in physics, it's usually considered a quark, even though they're trying to find this mysterious Higgs boson, which I won't tell you. <laughs> and, um, and so I thought the scientist in my dream was going to say, the cork. But what the scientist responded to in my dream is he said, sentience. Mm. And before this moment, I had never heard in my waking life the word sentient. I would heard sentient being thrown around the movies a bunch. And so in my dream, the connection I made when I heard sentience, I thought sentient being. And for a second, I was like, wait, what? I'm like, sentient being. Yeah, yeah, consciousness. I used to always say consciousness. And that day, um, I ended up looking in the dictionary, what does sentience even mean? And the simplest way to explain sentience is it means perspective. And this is one thing I'd recommend everyone meditate on to really see the difference um, in the similarities between perspective and consciousness. And consciousness sometimes is considered a way we process our perspective. But without any of that processing, without any of that filtering, there is just perspective. And it's the simplest form of a finite reality. And so one thing I'm going to talk about is the infinite and the finite. Now really the finite is really just infinite. And there is nothing that's actually finite. And so with the science I do, what I really focus on is patterns. And we have all these subjects now in science. They go all over the place. And we're all focused on little portions. We've lost this comprehensive nature to start to connect everything together. That's the holistic process of pulling all the sciences together. And the key to pulling that together is patterns and understanding patterns. And so the main thing I've been doing for about four years is vortex-based mathematics. Who's familiar with vortex-based mathematics? You got a few hands. Okay. Margaret Rowan pioneered 
uh, the math in the 70s. And what's different about this math over all the other math you've been taught in school, that's quantitative math. What about qualitative math? Mm -hmm. and that's getting into pattern structures. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I'm going to talk about is a lot about polarities, but even more important is trinities. And understand within every polarity, there's a midpoint, there's a balance, and that's the trinity. And when you understand this basic fundamental pattern, you can see how it starts to fractalize, how it starts to grow, how it starts to get more complex. And that these basic patterns I'm going to show you can be found everywhere around us. And you're a uh, exemplification of that pattern, but you've evolved, you've fractalized, you've become so complex. But when we understand these basic patterns as a foundation to science, it gives us foundation to grow from in terms of our technology, in terms of utilizing biomimicry. We refer to biomimicry. It's become a big thing in the permaculture movement to take something in nature and replicate that design. And so that's organic technology. And that's what we're really trying to do is to take technology and, and, and mimic nature instead of going away from it. And uh, who's here familiar with Nikola Tesla? Lots of hands. Awesome. Yay. Cool. So we're going to talk a little bit about Tesla. Tesla is uh, one of my favorite guys who's <laughs> roamed on the earth plane. Very, very intelligent man and very misunderstood in terms of what he did. And so I think one of the first things I'll talk about is I'll do a little bit of vortex math. Um, and sometimes the word math is just like a trigger for people. It just scares you away. Well, we're going we're gonna to reinvent this word and do something a little, a little different. If you have done vortex-based mathematics, it focuses, in, focuses on nine numbers, okay, but still relates to a base 10 system. And so all our mathematics, traditionally, is using base 10, counting 0 to 9. Well, the system I'm going to do is, is, is simpler to see some basic patterns and how these patterns <laughs> correlate to music. So musicians, this will just start clicking mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Artists, any of creative mindsets, this is, people will just download this. So mm -hmm. I'm feeling a lot of you are going to download this. When I, when I teach this to physicists and scientists, there's blockages. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is a completely different way to perceive things. And what I mean by blockages is we've been programmed with the wrong ideas of reality, of science. We have to reprogram ourselves. And so one aspect of, about me personally is I have an auditory processing disorder. And for a long time, I thought it was a hindrance. I was told it was a hindrance. And it, it turned into a blessing. I have a, I have a very good friend who actually works on um, revealing that mental illness is really a blessing. And it causes polarizations. And the thing is, a lot of mathematicians and physicists have the same disorder because it polarizes you visually in a way from the, the auditory. What happens as a child with people with auditory processing disorders is they have a hard time learning language. The thing about language is, language is the number one thing that reprograms our minds. If we don't get our minds reprogrammed, um, people with auditory processing disorder have excelled at math and physics because their mind hasn't been reprogrammed at a young age. Okay? Einstein had this disorder. But the really important thing with that statement is that saying Einstein is this really brilliant man. We're all Einstein. Every single one of us. We've just forgotten. We've been reprogrammed. And going to get a science degree, you reprogram your mind even more. So I'm going to do a little deprogramming today to talk about how energy really moves. Because some of the notions of how we think electricity works is way far from actually what's going on. And so. Hi. What I'm going to talk about first, so anyone can pick this up or someone hold it maybe? Here, you and I can hold it together. So, um, I'm going to talk about trinity num number systems. And why someone say, why are we using base 10? Why are we using base 4? Yeah. Um, why are we choosing these specific number systems over all the number systems? It's a very good question. And the reason is because of the inherent patterns that exist within the number systems. I'm going to talk about a trinity set of patterns, three types of patterns that are really important. So, to understand the base systems we work with, they're all based on powers of three. And the first power of three, three to the zero power, equals one. So we're getting back to some, you know, old school math. But with all these systems, you have to add a plus one. What I mean by the plus one is you've got to add a zero to the system. Okay? And so, this is going to make a lot more sense when I explain base two. So 3 to 0 power is 1. You add the plus 1 through 0 to the system. Base 2 is what all our computer systems are based off. Zeros and 1s, zeros and 1s. Okay? The really important concept to understand the zeros and 1s, the 0 is infinitely small, and 1 is infinitely large. 
everything and nothing. Okay? And if you take that system, you can understand quantitatively yeah. that's how computers how use you it. How do that? And, and they store all the information with those two, two pieces of quantity. But in terms of qualities, zeros and ones are the exact same thing. They're both infinite. And so how we make these number systems is uh, when you do only a qualitative perspective, a cyclical perspective, you're working with perspective. And so a number circle, okay, one of the most ancient symbols in astrology is a dot within a circle representing the sun. It relates to perspective. And so if you're in the center of this circle, you have three different perspectives in this type of number system. Um, this perspective, this perspective, this perspective. You do a 360 degree turn, your, your information is constantly changing. It's a different quality of information. Quantity is a distance away from you. Most of our science is based off of it. So we're into a whole different aspect on, on how to understand science. So if you do a base two system in a qualitative fashion, you, you only have the number one. Number one around the circle. Every single pattern in the series is one. So everything you use in base two is the exact same quali qualitatively. It's all infinite information. It's not until you get the next step up in the system until you get base four, three plus one, where you start to get these dynamic patterns. All right? um, there's three types of patterns. Um, there's linear sequences, doubling sequences, and Fibonacci sequences. I bet a lot of you are familiar with Fibonacci. Heard that golden mm -hmm. ratio. All right, so we're going to explain some music behind that. And I'm showing you just the very basics of this map. If you want to get more into it, you can go online to see Marco Rodin. But the idea one I'm going to be showing you is the pattern of the trinity. And the understanding the trinity in these systems. In the linear sequences, you can, um, is, is counting by one, counting by two, counting by three. And so one, two, three, it's counting by one. Counting by two, you got two, four, you go two, three, four, four is a one. Um, and then six, uh, five, six. So two, one, three. Um, well, counting by threes is always three. Three, six, nine. And so you have three different types of linear sequences. Now, in traditional mathematics, you were taught additive, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponents, and square roots. Well, these six functions are based on a function of trinity. Additive, multiplicative, exponential. And they have polarities to them. Well, the thing about those, those functions is there are ways that the fractal structure of our reality relates to each other. And the best way to see that is through yin and yang. How yin and yang relate to each other. And there's different growth and decay structures. That's what yin and yang is. It's growth and decay, expansion and contraction. There's different ways that those polarizations can relate to each other. There's a linear additive way. There's a multiplica multiplicative um, way, which we call the doubling sequence. Um, uh, the doubling sequence in base four is just one, two, one, two. One, two, we get the three, there's four, five, six, seven, eight, eight's the two. And so the doubling sequence is just going back and forth, one, two, one, two. This is really simplistic. When you get into the, the base 10 with the vortex um, math around nine numbers, which is what a lot of that system has been pushed forward in the past few years, I'm the only one who's been talking about base four. Um, it's just to simplify this and push this through instead of spending a whole hour talking about vortex math. Um, the Fibonacci sequence is the more interesting piece, and this is the piece I really like sharing. And Fibonacci is where you get into exponential relationships between things. This is where you can get into really dynamic energy systems technologically. And if you take the Fibonacci sequence, one, one, two, three, you take the last number you add it to itself, two and three is five, three and five is eight, five and eight is 13. You can take that number and you can count that series around the circle, okay? And if you take the number at where it was, you get this sequence that repeats. And just listen, one, one, two, three, two, two, one, three. The Fibonacci sequence repeats infinitely on that eight step pattern. Sounds just like music. One, one, two, three, two, two, one, three. And that pattern keeps fractalizing. In, in base 10, it's, it's based on 24 numbers. Yeah. It triples from eight numbers to 24 numbers. You get to base 28, it, it's now 72 numbers. Mm. There are more dynamic ways to see mm. the sequencing. In, in base 10, the doubling sequence is one, two, four, eight, seven, five. That six number sequence keeps repeating again and again. Before it was two numbers, now it's six numbers. So these sequences are growing at rates of three. There's three different relationships. 
Okay? This is the core foundation of my work, is seeing these, this triple relationship. They exist all throughout nature, all throughout science. And we talk a lot about, a lot about yin, yin and yang. So important, but seeing that midpoint. Okay? Well, with astrology, for example, if, if uh, my astral lens came, what is your sun sign? Scorpio, okay. You have a Scorpio, I'm a Virgo. Well, there's a third entity, a midpoint, that's created about our relationship. It's unique to just us. That energy is based around, most likely, Libra. Um, as it goes Virgo, Libra, Scorpio. And so that becomes a third entity in the system. When we can start to understand yeah. our systems as a system of midpoints, that idea of a midpoint can keep fractalizing. Mm -hmm. But then there's a midpoint of, of the midpoint and the polarization. And the whole fractal structure can take off if you just understand midpoints. And so one of the most fundamental uh, aspects of a reality in terms of a midpoint is a boundary layer. And that life loves the boundary layer. It loves to exist and flourish in the boundary layer. We are standing on the surface of the earth, the boundary layer between the sky <coughs> and the earth. Um, so I'm going to add to this quickly, is then how we can take this abstraction, these patterns, into something more concrete. So I can take that sequence, that eight-number sequence, and put it into a 2D grid. And so we have one, one, two, three. I have A here, it connects to this line, two, two, one, three. And the sequence starts here, one, one, two, three, two, two, one, three. So we have two oscillations of this musical sequence. It's best to think of this just like music, all right? And when you have a, a flat piece of paper like this, it just looks like a matrix. But what we can do... Are you taking questions? Uh, not the moment, but very soon. Um, if, if you take that flat piece of paper and you bend it in half, you can make a tube. And I was just saying, there's two circuits or two oscillations. This A connects to B, X connects to Y. If you bend that into a tube, you have, um, you have a cylinder. But that cylinder is a boundary layer. Okay? All this information is boundary layers. There's information inside the tube. There's information outside of the tube. And the information that's inside of the tube okay. is a double helix. You can almost imagine just two wires twisting together. That's the information inside of it. That's what this represents. But there's also a flow of energy outside of it. And so how I would make this in, in my shop in Asheville is I just take, say, two pieces of copper and twist it. The dense, compressed energy is on the inside of the boundary layer, which you can see, the masculine energy. But the feminine, submissive energy, which okay. you don't see, it's uh, the hidden dark energy, is, is, okay. is very light and spiraling okay. around it. And so yeah. one of the simplest polarizations you can experience is at night, you just look up in the sky and you see the stars, complete compression of space. And the darkness is the complete yeah. expansion of space. Sometimes we just put our intent into the light, but there's all this expansion at the same time. There's always these two things going on, and then there's a midpoint um, of that information. So what's at the midpoint of a planet in space? It's us. And so Nassim Haramein talks about the event horizon, finding this midpoint in the fractal structure. We are the midpoint. There's the macrocosm going up into the universes, and the microcosm going down to the quantum level. We are the midpoint. We are the most dynamic part of that fractal system. And so you can then take that cylinder and you can bend it into itself. That's another thing that the scene talks about is the torus. And you get one of the most dynamic pieces of geometry in nature. Well, with this torus, this torus creates a four-point star that collapses down to a single point in space. Okay? And if you saw this in 3D, how one of these circuits would look like is a twisted figure eight. Um, the, the two circles would be 90 degrees to each other, and they interweave with each other. And so a big thing I do is studying the different toroidal geometries that exist within, within this math, such as the Star of David, a hexagram. That's based off a 6x6 six six matrix in, in base 10. There's uh, the octagram, which I'm going to talk uh, a little bit more about. Where did we go? Some little octagram? I have them somewhere here. Um, okay. I had some coils back there, but... No, that's not them. Oh, I'm wearing one. There you go. I'm wearing one. All right? This is an octogram. This is based off an 8x9 matrix in base 10. And this contains three oscillations of the Fibonacci sequence. And so what I mean by that, it's understanding the specific flow of energy in this piece. And how do we get... It's basically... This is a stage. I made a stage. But with this information, I know how to play the right music on that stage to make it just flourish, to make it blossom. And so this is this is a center part in a lot of my work. You guys can sit right down there. 
Thank you. Um, so before I go on to, to um, other types of applications with, with these concepts, anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Hmm? What are the names of the two individuals holding the paper? Well, it was Dan Axelrod, who Dan assists Axelrod. me in the shop, and... Chelsea. Chelsea, okay. Thank you, you two. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, yes. There's a pattern that um, you created. Did you work backwards? From, like, did you look at nature and then find the pattern, or did you find the pattern and then try it out of nature? And so I, sort of did, I sort of did both, because yeah. I started with the basic patterns, and, then, and seeing how the patterns track the lines, but then there's also specific ancient symbols I knew existed. And so it's like, how can you use the math to fit into these ancient symbols? And, and some of them fit beautifully. What I'm still trying to fi figure out is how a pentacle works. Um, and that specific flow of information. So there's lots of all these in ancient star symbols, um, and they correlate to specific information systems. And how those information systems work is through vibration. So I'm going to talk about vibration. And vibration is, is the essence of everything. And so a good way to start this is um, I can use these two spheres. I'm going to call them, we'll call this one because it almost looks like aluminum. We'll say this is pure aluminum, OK? So this is pure aluminum, we'll call this pure copper. <coughs> and the reason I'm going to use these examples is I just know the numbers. Copper, at around room temperature, has a resonant frequency of 44 megahertz. It's 44 million hertz. What that means is every atom in it, you know, the ideas of atoms and electrons, they don't talk much about particles because there's a lot of bad quantum thinking out there. Um, but you could say this entity, this atom, is vibrating between all the other atoms at a specific frequency. That frequency in aluminum is 38 megahertz. Okay? And so in my hand right now, the space this aluminum is, is occupying is oscillating at 38 megahertz. Okay? Now, let's replace that exact same space and put copper. I just changed the space to 44 megahertz, okay? But the thing is, if we're saying the Earth, the universe, none of that's moving, we're not rotating. The space right here is static. It does not move. And that space is composed of a cubic structure. So who's, who's here familiar with the platonic solids, the five platonic solids? Really important subject in, in sacred geometry. Well, there's a, a midpoint of those five platonic solids, and it's the cube. It's composed of all 90 degree angles. And the um, tetrahedron and the octahedron are the convex shapes. It points energy in. They're less than 90 degrees. Well, the dodecahedron and the icosahedron um, are uh, concave uh, geometries, and they, they expand the energy. Um, greater than 90 degrees. So these are traditional concepts, you're just, you're, just, you're just synthesizing it. And so I'd recommend just looking and like, even meditating on these geometries. And think about the cube, it's the midpoint. It's, it's an equilibrium of these energies. And so there is no information in space whatsoever. It's completely static. It's the void. It's purely cubic. Nothing's been applied to it. It's in a state of pure equilibrium. But as soon as I say, put that copper in that space, okay? The copper starts to cause that cubic structure to change its shape, changes the shape to the structure of copper, which is actually it's based on a cubic structure of copper. Um, but there's tons of different structures for crystals and other elements. Um, so it changes it around that structure, but that space starts to fluctuate at uh, 44 yeah, megahertz. Like As I'm moving this, this ball isn't moving, space isn't moving. <laughs> What's happening is that vibration of information, this ceases to vibrate, this starts to vibrate. And so I'm just moving that vibration through space. You're just transmitting it. There is no motion. And so probably the only equation I'm going to bring up here is the most, one of the most important equations you could ever learn is frequency multiplied by wavelength, the wavelength of a frequency. Um, and so you can say this is, this is a one-foot wave. It's oscillating up and down in, um, in um, say, one oscillation a second um, to be one hertz. Frequency multiplied by wavelength equals the rate in which the energy transfers in the system. So it's, it's a common equation physicists use. What's really important to understand is they have specific jargon applied to it. But frequency is time, wavelength is space. 
and the velocity is the illusion of motion. And so when you multiply time by space, you get the illusion of motion. Would you say when you were moving it, it was blinking in and out, on and off? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that's another thing. You don't even see it. The, the things are oscillating so fast. There's a point where that every every moment in that oscillation is having 44 million times a second. Half of that oscillation, 44 million times, it's there, and 44 million times, it's not there. We don't see it. Amplitude? Yeah, yeah, amplitude yeah, would be like density of energy in space. I can get into that. Okay. Um, and the simplest way to understand that is when I say cubic space, there's no twist in it. There's no information. You want to increase the amplitude in that space, you start twisting the space. The more you twist it, the more energy that's stored in the space. And so, um, vibration, there's two fundamental forms of vibration. Longitudinal and transverse. Most of us are more familiar with transverse. I usually have a slinky with me, and I forgot a slinky. Any chance anyone has a slinky on me? <laughs> okay. Well, I think we can all visualize a slinky. I've done a lot of like visualization stuff, and that's the majority of my lectures. Like, really tap into your third eye and try to connect with my language to, to bring up that imagery in your third eye. And so let's say I have a slinky right now in my hand. All right? I take one end of the slinky and I compress it. All right? That compression on one end, you could say, is your yin energy. Feminine energy is, is a compressive, compressive form of energy, and the expansive form is your yang energy. Right? When I let go of that slinky, it bounces back and forth. That's a longitudinal wave. It's a pressure wave. It's how sound works. The beautiful thing Tesla did is Tesla figured out there's another form of these longitudinal waves that exist outside of sound, and they move faster than the speed of light. Um, in the work I do, I've been, I've been really laying out dimensional theory. You're saying zero dimension, the first dimension, the second, the third. So those are the primary ones I work with. The first dimension is what I would call longitudinal waves. Um, Tesla, some people call them scalar waves. Um, they move fast on the speed of light. Um, and I work on electrostatic properties. And so I'll explain a little bit more of the difference between electrostatic energy and kinetic electricity. We use the form of kinetic electricity. It's very detrimental. Um, we have like amperage. Amperage is a waste of energy. I, mean, I can get into that. So there's a whole different way to perceive our energy systems. The second form of vibrations are transverse waves. And transverse waves is if I had that slinky up here and I was going up and down with it, and you actually see the waveform moving through it, that waveform moves much slower to the other end. That's a transverse wave. That's how electromagnetic light moves. That's transverse waves. And in my work, uh, I consider the second dimension to be composed of electromagnetic energies, or toroidal fields. And the simplest way to understand that is if you have one form of energy moving this way, longitudinally, and you have this other form of energy moving this way, longitudinally, to the point where they collide. Okay? When that collision happens, physicists sometimes say that um, the energy cancels out. But the thing is, this is also to say energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So there's all these paradoxes in sciences. And so one of my favorite things to say is when I start talking free energy, people will bring up, well, that violates the second law of thermodynamics. And as I usually say is, well, they don't understand their own laws. They don't. They really don't. And there's all these paradoxes in science when they create one law, another law, but they don't um, mesh together. So what actually happens when those two energies collide together, they don't cancel out. It just changes the different form of dimensional energy. So when we slam together, we have to expand perpendicularly in a radial form. When that happens, that creates your toroidal field. That creates the electromagnetic field. That gives birth to the second dimension. And I'm, I'm not going to go in depth in, but through that um, the process of being made, coming together to convert energy to another dimensional axis, you can do that same thing electromagnetically convert energy to third dimensional substances. So third dimensional energy, uh, we're much more familiar with this mechanical energy, uh, acoustic vibrations. Um, and you know, about the vibration in the lattice of the space, that's a third dimensional vibration. And so one of the cool things you can do with ideas like that is if you know the vibration of the substance in space, you know another vibration of the substance in space, you can convert that space into another substance.
another form of these vibrations with the transverse wave and the uh, longitudinal wave. They're called standing waves. And so when I talk about those two um, waves crashing together, it creates what's called also a standing wave. The thing is, a longitudinal standing wave gives birth to a transverse wave at the same time. That's one thing physics doesn't talk about. And a transverse standing wave, we've all seen. A jump rope, and if you're just going up and down with that jump rope, you're creating a transverse standing wave, except it's a single wavelength going up and down. But the energy is being transferred equally by the two people. If the people start to transfer energy out of resonance, um, what we call dissonance, and it's not the two, then you start to get all these funky wave patterns and you don't get the standing wave form. Everything you see around us is standing waves. And it creates the illusion also that nothing is moving um, with this cancellation of energy. So these concepts of vibration are saying real vibrational mechanics and how vibrations interact with each other, gaining ideas of, of resonance, and such as if this sphere has a specific resonant frequency, and I have all these spheres laid out on the floor at a specific distance from each other. And that distance is based on this is gonna have a wavelength through the sphere. And once that energy transmits in the air, the air, because it has a, a different velocity in which the energy travels through, it changes the wavelength. So you can say the wavelength could be this long, it, uh, you know, a couple inches in a sphere, but as soon as it leaves, it might expand out to like two feet. When we take all those spheres and lay them out, and say a flower of light then, and then come at the right distance to each other, we just get one note, that one resonant frequency of that sphere. All of them will start going. And a beautiful system. And you can get an exponential energy force. And this is what Tesla was really starting to understand and grasp with his tower systems. And so the beautiful thing about taking the idea of, of vibrational technologies is how you amplify and rework energy. Because we're not really creating energy out of thin air. You're just transmuting it, you're moving it around. And there's it's, it's understanding this exponential nature and how to tap into this exponential energy, which is the golden ratio. Another name to figure out there is, uh, or who's familiar with Dan Winter? You have a few hands? Dan Winter is a very brilliant man who talks about uh, constructive interference. He's using the golden ratio. This is what your heart does. Your heart has a double toroidal field, which compresses blood which um, has uh, magnetic properties in it, and it's compressing it with this constructive interference based on the golden ratio. What that means is it, it creates a perpetual fractal structure down to a single point in space. And people would be like, you're sending the energy into a single point in space. But that's where you're, you're, using, you're, you're thinking with time. We're not sending the energy. It's not traveling down there. You're creating in that very specific moment in space and time a structure that exists between the macro all the way down to the micro. This so is one of the big ideas of energy systems. How do we replicate what the heart does? How do we create this structure to connect with source? Because your heart stops being, you lose your connection with source. And so the systems we're working on is, is replicating the process of the heart and what the heart does. Um, Can I share something? Yeah, go for it, Eve. This is, this is my lovely friend, Eve, everyone. Hi. Um, about 14 years ago, I was at UNCA, and Dan Winter um, had an um, ex experimental um, instrument that I was witness to that they called all of the um, music graduates in to see, and I knew somebody that knew Dan Winter, so I got by it too, even though I wasn't a student. And uh, the instrument was a physical, like, drum machine that Rhythm Man ended up playing from Bela Fleck as part of the experiment. Was anybody else there or knew about this or heard about this? I love Bela Fleck. Yeah, so um, the instrument actually did it. It took people um, and asked them to sit down and recorded, maybe through wires and frequency, I'm not sure how the vibration was collected, um, but recorded emotions people sitting in a state, possibly toning, I'm really not sure if it was just thinking and vibrating and feeling, but primarily the emotions of love and then grief and then fear and then anger. And then they piped those into a drum machine and without telling anybody what the concert was going to be, <laughs> um, had Rhythm Man from Bela Fleck play this machine that had these vibrations tapped into it. And it was amazing because I kind of knew and was open to receiving my own experience 
but all of these uh, graduate students at, at UNCA, or not graduate, but anyway, students at UNCA didn't know, and there was a variety of euphoric experiences, like, you know, crying and weeping and love and joy and standing up at different movements and not knowing why, and then, of mm -hmm. course, the beautiful explana explanation afterwards that most people couldn't really connect yeah. with, but they would still just like this Mommy. amazing experience. Mommy. Anyway, so it's out there, obviously. <laughs> I just wanted to share that when you mentioned Dan Winter. It's amazing. Maybe you can find the resource of that, that and tap that into your class or something at some point. Absolutely. But, yeah. Thanks um, for letting me share. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. So I talked a little math earlier, and I was just getting into physics, and then I talked a little bit more physics, and then we're going to get into earth science. Earth science is really a few things. It sees how it relates to your actual environment, how it affects you. And so in physics, um, I call the trinity of physics in this pattern of three. Uh, in terms of yin energy, the feminine energy, you have the implosive energy. That's what Dan Winter really focuses on, is this implosive energy, the spiraling in. Um, of energy, but then there's also centrifugal energy, centrifugal force, the, the yang of energy, it's a spiraling out, it's your expansive energy, um, it's your magnetic energy, magnetism is a yang force, it's expansive, it wants to fill as much space as it possibly can, so the electrical form, the feminine aspect, wants to compress as much energy into a single little space, and the balance point of these two forces, the spiraling in, the spiraling out, is your circle, it's torque, it's rotation, it's twist, it's spin. When you balance those two forces together, that's how you create, well you create an imbalance of those two forces, is how you create rotation. And that's what we're saying the golden ratio. Golden ratio is a dynamic ratio between yin and yang energy. There's also other constants in math, such as pi. Pi we use, oh it helps us find circles. But they're sort of missing a part, because every equation with pi requires a linear input. Pi is the boundary layer between linear information and cyclical information. This is a different way to start to view mathematics. There's a specific reason this constant exists, and they're all forms of boundary layers. And so, with these concepts of, of, of torque and centripetal force and centrifugal force, you can start to really explore the kinetics and the motion of and so let's, let, let's, uh, let's do a little deprogramming exercise and in terms of electricity, okay? Now, usually copper, okay, here's a copper wand maybe, um, and I'm gonna explain to an exercise at the end of these with you, is copper is usually called a conductor of electricity. <laughs> but really the quick, quick, well actually before I go into that, there, there's the air next to it, okay? We have copper, we have air. And we'll say air is an insulator of electricity. And we sort of have our ideas slightly backward. Because when we broadcast an electromagnetic wave, it travels through air, okay? That air absorbs the energy and releases it right back out with very little loss of energy. Air is conducting the electromagnetic radiation. Well, copper, absorbs that radiation. It doesn't conduct it, it absorbs it. But you really don't even want it to absorb it. That's how all our energy systems work. We're absorbing that electrical energy. It turns into heat, we call it amperage. And they say that the surface has more electrons than the inner part. It's because the surface is absorbing that energy. Just like if you have a black, um, big black piece of stone out on the ground, the surface of it is going to get the hottest is going to get less hot going down through the surface. It's turning that energy into heat. What you want to use copper as, do you want to use copper as a mirror? You want to reflect the energy. And so, what's funny is, I've only come to this realization of that concept recently, um, is I've understood this intuitively for a long time. And so it's one of those things where reading traditional physics has, has warped my mind, and intuitively I've understood it for about six years because I do energy work, I do Reiki. And one of the things I understood is, is making a chi ball. Everyone's made an energy ball in front of you. And so you have our hand chakras in the center of your palms. We're going to do an exercise later to help you open up your hand chakras for those who haven't experienced it. Um, well, your hands are conductors of energy in the traditional notion. 
if I, if I take a voltmeter and I touch it to you know, either of my hands, I'm going to get a flow, flow of voltage through it. Very, very, very low current, but voltage. This pressure of energy moving from one hand to the other, like a tenth of a volt. Okay? Now, in between my hands, I'm just putting my hands together like this, I can start to feel the energy build between them. And the thing to think about is that my hands are the nodes in this waveform. Um, they're the reflectors. The energy is bouncing back and forth between my hands. My hands are not absorbing the energy. They're just reflecting it. And to build this chi ball, you compress it, and you expand it, you compress it, and you expand it. This energy can just keep building, but it's building in the air. We call those insulators, but in electrical engineering, it's traditionally referred to as a dielectric. And that the real energy with electricity is in the dielectric. It's not in the electrical conductor. You want to store it in that. And so, one of the capacitors we're building in the shop, I just should also show you the traditional notion of a capacitor. You'll say this is a positive charge and this is a negative charge. You have a dielectric in between it to insulate the two. All right? Now, the idea of traditional capacitors is as much surface area as possible with, with flat pates, taking two flat pates, bringing as close to as possible as together, and putting an insulator in there, like, say, epoxy. And what you're able, what the capacitors we're building is in difference to say you can take two pyramids, like pyramids of Giza, made out of copper, and you point them at each other. And there's this little space in between it. Well, what you can do is say we're putting, uh, uh, the, the crystals we're using are root tile crystals, titanium dioxide. And they're amazing dielectrics. And say we have a root tile that's a centimeter long. Well, uh, root tile can handle 6,000 volts per millimeter. So for a centimeter, it can handle 60,000 volts before it pulses through it. And so I can stick that crystal in between the pyramid, and we can put the 60,000 volts in the system, and it won't pulse through. But all the energy stored in the system is being stored in the crystal. It is not being stored in the copper. And so you can make really efficient, high-powered devices that start to actually utilize crystals, and really understand crystals. They're saying how pyrite works. Um, understanding how quartz works, root tiles, I was saying, and, and putting these in application because the crystals are the conductor of the ether, while copper and gold and silver are all the reflectors of the ether. And you use them as waveguides to build up coherent energy systems. Is that like a radio? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so the radio was actually originally invented by Tesla, and the idea was stolen by Marconi. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's, a, it's, a simple, it's a simple free energy device, a radio. It's tuning into a frequency. And so the, the thing what Tesla was doing was taking a really powerful frequency, the ionosphere. So I'm going to get into the earth science part. Um, and tuning into that and then amplifying the Tesla transformer. So let's explain the dynamic of, of our home planet Earth and what's going on every single moment on this planet. Around the Earth is something called the ionosphere. The ionosphere is composed of protons, or hydrogen. Hydrogen without the electrons. Ionized hydrogen it comes from the solar wind coming from our sun. It happens 24-7, non-stop. Solar winds fluctuate, though. They're always coming. And the solar winds are composed of hydrogen. And that hydrogen builds up around the Earth. And that hydrogen, again, it's ionized hydrogen, um, it keeps building up. And as it builds up, um, think about positive charges and negative charges with electricity. Think about a positive charge sheath around our planet is a, a form is a centripetal spiral. And so when I was talking about electricity as a centripetal implosive force, positive and negative charges are just opposing spins. And so you have this one type of spin spiraling down all around the Earth. It's energy compression, <laughs> compressing on to the Earth. That is where we got gravity completely backwards. Gravity is not pulling us down. It is pushing us on the Earth. It's a pressure system pushing us down here. And that's and the main effect is the ionosphere. Gravity is an electromagnetic effect. It's an electrostatic effect, actually. And it's, it's compressing us constantly all the time. We can't compress. You can only compress so much. We can't handle that pressure anymore. What happens? Does anyone know what happens? What does the Earth do? Lightning strike. It happens every single moment on this planet somewhere, mostly in the tropics, but the lightning strikes. That is a discharge of the ionosphere. As soon as it discharges, it starts to expand a little bit back out from that discharge, but the solar winds come back in and recharge it. So there's this constant compression on the planet. 
that causes what we experience is gravity. Well, that's also a frequency. There's a frequency of this compression. And that's what Tesla figured out. And Tesla started tuning into this frequency. We got, we got a tree right here, a beautiful tree. Guess what it's doing? It's tuning into that frequency. Every single tree on this planet helps support our electromagnetic field. Everyone you cut down helps decrease that field. When you, when you are sitting down meditating and straining up your spine, you're, you're essentially performing the tree meditation. Um, I'm going to explain those, those concepts. And so, with the, the Tesla Tower, which is um, the big thing I've been working on, with the Tesla Tower, the idea is to get this tower oscillating with this frequency. And it's tuning this tower to this frequency. Essentially, we're making a synthetic tree. We're making a very powerful synthetic tree. And you can tune it to this, to this frequency of compression. Um, and it gives us an oscillator, a, uh, a decent oscillator, a, a signal. You can then take that signal and put it through something called a Tesla transformer. And what Tesla transformer is, or any energy transformer, is essentially uh, a lever. A lever is the simplest form of a transformer. If we have a, a teeter-totter and, the, and the, the fulcrum is right in the center, you have a perfect exchange of energy. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, but if we slide that fulcrum in any direction, you start to change the ratio of that energy. Um, where one side's really easy to push down, and the other one's really hard to push down because you lift something heavy by changing the energy. You're transforming the energy. Well, electromagnetic transformer does just that. And it does it with um, a primary and secondary circuit, technically. And when I say a primary circuit, it's taking a piece of copper wire and spiraling it. And say you pulse this, this, this piece of copper, what that does is the space around this copper, it starts to twist it. It starts to distort it. The more power you put into it, the more it twists up. If you stop powering that coil, you stop powering that twist. It has to untwist. You get what's called a collapsing magnetic field. And it's, just like, it's just an unspiraling twisting motion. Now, if you have, say, 10 wraps on this, on this wire, okay, and, and you're twisting space, but then you have another uh, a wire, which you call your secondary, and you could have 100 wraps on it. Well, when that one um, starts to untwist, the energy transfers to the secondary, so they're coupling to the same space, they're both a part of the same space. But because it has to travel through that whole wire um, 10 times more than the other wire, there's more distance it has to travel, it travels 10 times as fast. And so this is how a transformer works. And so we take a little signal, we put it in the transformer, and then we accelerate it. We make it fly as fast as you possibly can think, pretty much near the speed of light. And you can then have free energy. Well, you can take it a step further, a big step further. And this is what Tesla understood with Wardenclyffe Tower. Wardenclyffe Tower was a design he was building um, on Long Island, and it will have powered the entire New York metropolitan area. And it will have been the start for a whole new power grid system. Because when you have one of these towers up, um, you can build a second tower, and you start to tune the towers together. And so I've been talking about electromagnetics. I've been talking about second dimensional energy. Guess what? We've got this whole thing called first dimensional energy. It's scalar waves. And they're faster than the light. They have more energy. And it's everywhere. And so there's a... Who's familiar with ley lines? All right. Not enough handling. That is an awesome thing for people to go out there and research. It's really understand 